Darren Patrick is with me here, and uh, he's the lead pastor at The Journey in St. Louis, where he's been for almost 10 years now, planted the church in 2002. He wrote this book on the church planter, the man, the message, and the mission. When I opened it and read the preface in particular, why focus on men, I was really jealous to have Darren come and be a part of the Desiring God Conference for Pastors in January of 2012, which thank you for being willing to do. Page 11, you say, uh, this researcher says, uh, in 1970, 69% of 25-year-olds and 85% of 30-year-old white men were married. So 69 and 85. In 2000, so that's now 30 years later, 2000, only 33%, not 69, and 58%, not 85, were married respectively at those ages. And you suggest this data is probably not slowing. Now, when I read this, that's astonishing to me. Um, there are names being given to this phenomenon. Uh, say, say the names and anything about that that you think would be helpful for us to hear. What, why, why is it happening and what are the implications for, for ministry? Yeah, one of the, one of the terms is um, adult adolescence. So adolescence as adults, um, a, to a term that I kind of put together is, for men, is ban. It's like kind of half boy, half man, or three quarters boy, one fourth man. B-A-N, boy and man. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I think it goes back to the brokenness of our culture. I think a lot of people saw their parents' marriage and said no thanks, and um, didn't see dad um, loving, didn't see dad sacrificing, uh, uh, didn't see him uh, speaking into, encouraging, um, nourishing his wife's heart, and then saw bitterness in mom, saw, you know, brokenness that wasn't, you know, a direct, you know, all these things that marriage, the collapse of marriage. I think a lot of, you know, children saw that and said, I'm not going to do that. So I think that's part, but I also think in that is not only did they not see almost passively a good marriage, but then actively they weren't parented well. So they, they're not equipped financially. They're not equipped emotionally. They're not equipped spiritually. And they think to themselves, almost subconsciously, I think, although they articulate it more than uh, I can believe in my ministry, I've heard it over and over again, I'm not ready for that. I can't do that. I can't take responsibility for myself. How am I going to be responsible for another person? Let me, let me try out... Um a couple of definitions of manhood and womanhood and then come back and say, how can we help at that point? Because that, that sounds pretty bleak, sounds pretty hopeless, um, whether or not the church at that moment can insert itself and something change. So, so he, he, one of the burdens I have in the way I've come at this over the years in, in wrestling and debating with egalitarians is to say, when a typical egalitarian tries to define the essence of manhood, the essence of womanhood, they almost always talk in generic terms that are human, gentle, humble, kind, caring, servant-like. I say, well, yeah, that's what all Christians should be, but it doesn't make any distinction between man and woman, so you're not answering my question. And the way I've tried to say it is, what, what are we going to say to our nine-year-olds father to son. Daddy, what does it mean to grow up and be a man and not a woman? Now he doesn't, if, if the answer you give him kindness, gentleness, love, servanthood, he's not going to know what manhood is because that's what he'd say to his daughter. So I want to know the answer to the question, what does it mean to be a man and not a woman? So my effort is to try to pinpoint what, what I see biblically rooted in creation is that um, mature masculinity or manhood is um, a sense of benevolent responsibility. Sense of, you may not always have the resources to take it in any given situation, but you've got this sense inside that I should, I should assume some responsibility and accountability here to lead 
and provide for and protect women, and, and then that, that sounds like marriage, but I would say in, in uh, ways that are appropriate to the differing relationships. So a 13-year-old boy in relation to a 12-year-old girl should orient himself on the playground differently than with another boy. And how he, he cares for her, protects her, honors her. It's, there's a difference. There's a dynamic there. He's just not two human beings. They're, they're different. Or I used the illustration one time when I was teaching of uh, two students walking from the college over to McDonald's, a guy and a gal dating, and guy jumps out with a knife. Now, suppose she has a black belt in karate. So you can take this guy out. Suppose this guy knows she does. I would say, if he says, take him, he's not a man. He's not a man. He should step in front of her and say, over my dead body. Now, she may win the battle at the end. Kick him, kick him. And, but he's, he's done manly things. It he has the sense that he should. Precisely. He had the sense, this is what I'm called to do here. It's not a competency issue. It's not a competency issue in marriage. It's not a competency issue in the world. It's a, it's a sense, a God-given sense of, of, of leading, protecting, providing. And then, and then the reverse is the essence or at the heart of, of biblical mature femininity is a freeing um, support and affirmation and nurturing of that leadership and that strength. She comes alongside men in ways that are appropriate to the various relationships. So she might receive, as a single woman, 30-year-old, a bank manager, and uh, the teller uh, is a guy, the dynamic there of him uh, walking with her to her car in the parking ramp after dark, she'll receive that offer as that's what you should do. You should want to care about me in this dark parking ramp, and I receive that. I honor you for that. That dynamic, there's, there's, she's single, he's single. It's not, this, is not a, this is not a marriage thing at all. So that's my effort to just kind of get at the, at the core. Now, let's come back to, to the issue of we live in a day where you've just described thousands of, of men who are postponing their adulthood, extending adolescence, and uh, feeling, I, I'm, not, I'm not there. So what can we, what do you do now to, to help that situation? I mean, we can't get them into homes and you know, go back into my mama's womb and relive. So what can we do? Yeah. Well, I think there is an element of reparenting that, par that pastors have to do now that maybe they didn't have to do 15, 20, 30 years ago. That there is a, um, just some baseline things that mom and dad should have taught specifically dad should have taught but didn't. And so I think, you know, identifying that, saying it's okay, like it's really not your fault that you weren't taught how to balance your checkbook. It's really not your fault that you were not taught how to keep your pants on. It, it's, you didn't know, the culture um, moves you uh, towards, you know, basically, you know, throwing off all restraint, doing whatever you want to do, that's, that's what manhood is. Um, we're gonna help you with that. And so, number one, it's a posture. We're going to help you, and, and it's okay. You don't need to be full of shame. You don't need to be, God brought you here. We're going to be your spiritual family and help you with these things and, and, and help you understand it. And I think, I think um, for most young men that I've seen, they, they really respond to that because they know they're in trouble. You don't have to tell them they're in trouble. They know it. They know that they, they cannot keep a relationship. They know that they prefer... Uh, porn to an interaction with a w real woman. They know that's wrong. They get it. And I think it's our job then to come alongside them with a posture of, hey, I'm going to be a dad. And I'm going to walk alongside you. And I'm going to call the best out in you. There are things in you that you have pushed down, glossed over, and I'm going to speak to that because God has made you differently. You were made to have courage. You were made to sacrifice first. You were made to forgive first. And we're going to call you, you know, that out of you, and we're going to use the Scripture and help you orient your life to the story of Scripture so that you see yourself not as the main character, but as an important character in God's story. And it, it can change a man's life. It's, it, 
we've talked enough, and I've, I've read enough in here, your book, to know that you believe, and I believe, that manhood and womanhood are rooted in nature, in creation. It's not merely cultural. There are things about it that are sunk deep, which means, I think, and it's what's so amazing to me today, that, that in the X-29 movement and, uh, and other complementarian uh, groups, it, it isn't in the way. In other words, believing that men should assume a certain role, women should assume certain roles, they should complement each other, is not hindering evangelism, but can actually be a rescue, part of the rescue operation. So how does, how does that work? How, how, could, how could what, I think you said in, in a previous video that you were told to plant a church, you gotta be egalitarian, fit the culture. Now you, you're obviously going in another direction, you're succeeding, people are coming to Christ, they're coming to the church, why? How does that work? Well, I think, there's, I think we can reflect culturally for a moment. Look at movies, and specifically the whole Twilight thing, which I'm really confident you have no idea what I'm talking about at that I point. Heard the word Praise the Lord that you do not yeah, know. And I've never seen one, and I won't, but I know the premise. The idea with several movies, and specifically these movies, is, is of this protector, this male who's a protector. He knows the heart. He responds with courage but tenderness, all those kind of things, um, people know it. They just know it. So when you speak and you have Bible verses and you help them understand, hey, big picture, this is how you were made and this is why God talks about these things this way. The light bulb goes off and it makes sense. It makes sense of their childhood. It makes sense of their um, broken relationships. It makes sense of their divorce. It makes sense of the struggles in their marriage and the glories of their marriage, and the glories of children. I think it, it, you have to be careful, you have to be nuanced, you have to know what you're speaking into, right? But it is absolutely, uh, we, we've seen, it is, it is, I think, specifically for young men and women, um, probably, you know, if you want to call it contextualization, it, it's been our greatest one because it just hits the heart in ways the young men go, I knew that's the man I was supposed to meet. The young women go, you know what, that's the man I want, and I'm offended. My feminism is getting tweaked, but I, what I'm going and dealing with and reading, it's not working. That's the kind of man I want. That's the kind of man he's talking about. That's the kind of man God says he should be. Well, I want to be that kind of woman. So finish, finish it off like this. We're talking about manhood and womanhood, but we're not on a crusade mainly to create men and women. We're on a crusade to create Christians. That is, we want people to believe the gospel, love the gospel, magnify Jesus Christ. This is part of the package, but how, how, how does manhood and womanhood get completed with the gospel or get completed with, with Christ? Yeah, I think the idea with, with Jesus, I mean, he, um, he's tough and he's tender. He uh, absolutely will get in the face of wicked, self-righteous religious leaders and then hug a child. Mm -hmm. So I think when we come to Christ and meet Him, um, men get appropriately tougher and appropriately more tender. Mm -hmm. And I think the same thing that ha happens in women. And I think what happens is we are completed, it, it's like um, it's like the end of the story, the last chapter that resolves, the final scene of the movie. There's a sense that, all right, my life makes sense. My experiences make sense. Um, I am a female, but it's a, it's a bigger deal than that. I, I have a, I'm, a, I'm a part of a greater story. I, I have a sense that I'm bringing to the table not just my femininity, but my spiritual gifts. Not just to serve a family or to get a husband or to love some children, but to bless a church. Um, I'm, I'm here as a man not just to make money and, and climb a ladder and have a hobby. I'm here to give my life away for the body of Christ. And that only happens through conversion. The Desire God Conference for Pastors is at the end of January 2012. And if, if your pastor or if you are a pastor, uh, could benefit from this kind of conversation, this kind of dialogue, this kind of probing into the meaning of manhood and womanhood and how it makes a difference in ministry. We hope you'll be there.